Okay, so I'm, I'm definitely well prepared for this talk. Uh, you know, haven't uh, memorized all my notes, but there's plenty of pages of notes, so this might go on for a few hours. Um, we, I might as well start off with a little bit of who I am and what I do. Um, so I'm Chris Manson, you can follow me on Twitter there. Um, my company's name is Stone Circle. I do consulting and uh, mentoring and things like that, and Offmaker, as you'll see in a little bit. Um, I have been doing Ember, and I'm a big kind of Ember guy, and I've been doing it since December 2011. And if, you, if anybody knows the history of Ember, that's before 1.0, so it was the, uh, the fun times. Uh, so I've been there for quite a while. I was always known as the Ember guy, but I'm in Intercom now, so it's like, pfft, surrounded by you guys. But anyway, so uh, instead of jumping straight into what this three days to MBC and what Authmaker is, I thought I'd give a little bit of the history of how we actually got here, because it, it kind of puts it a little bit more in context and to understand why it, I built this thing and what it's for. Um, <clears throat> so I started my first startup there in 2011 with Node, Ember, the kind of new shiny technologies and the kind of naive way that you do and you're like, oh, I'm going to use the best things. And, you know, even though I was using the kind of new shiny just for the sake of it starting off, I always had this concept that you shouldn't... There's always this idea of like the right way to build a particular type of application. If you're doing a chat app, there's like a canonical way that we're all just messing around trying to find. Um, and back then, uh, I was um, I started off in Angular actually. So I implemented the our first front end in Angular, and then decided you know it wasn't really for me because Angular had this idea that. You had to you had to really kind of know what you were doing. It didn't give you any of the didn't treat you with kid gloves, especially back then. This was also pre 1.0 of Angular. So it's you know me as a budding young JavaScript developer who didn't really know what he was doing, didn't know how to how to structure my apps correctly. So that's when Ember came along, and they had already started, and they came from the Ruby ilk and the convention over configuration. Just even having this concept of there being a slightly better way to do it and you know kind of bringing developers along with them um, <laughs> and so as you do with startups you build your application and then you want to go live with it so we we started with a launch rock system just to kind of collect emails and normal sort of sales stuff but then with this idea of there being a right way to build JavaScript applications, I also had this concept of there being a right way to do the login part of your app. It, it baffled me that there was no off-the-shelf implementation of a login system that, you know, got people's emails, got them to sign up, but not quite into the app yet, and then when you're ready to launch the app, that there's a way for you to kind of click a button and let a few of them in, and then for them not to have to jump, or you to Im export from LaunchRock and then import into a SQL database and so on and so forth. I was surprised that there was nothing like that. Um, so this was one of the things that kind of made me think about what I could do. As it turned out, we ended up implementing our own uh, auth system. And you know, back then, I wasn't a very good JavaScript developer, as I said, and I had no business writing an auth system. Actually, I didn't write it in the first place. We had a, a contractor write it, and I had to rewrite it in a weekend, which uh, Mark there in the back was uh, present for. It was three days of absolute hell to just do it before our first big launch. But since then, there have been a few things that have come out that are off-the-shelf login systems. You know, Stormpath, and we've already heard Auth0 already here. But again, these two applications aren't... They're not the Ember way of doing things. It doesn't kind of tell you how you should implement your application. They're very much the uh, React and Angular way of doing things, which is, you know, here are a few libraries, here, ha here is how you can use it. You know, I'm trolling here, I'm a little bit, sorry about that, but uh, they, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't hold you to a particular way of structuring the application. And a lot of the times that is a good thing if you know what you're doing, but like I said, I didn't know what I was doing. So with that, um, 
<laughs> uh, with that, we're going to jump on to the actual talk itself. So what, what does this all mean? So I think the best way for me to, to get at this is to talk a little bit about what I meant by this and parse it a little bit. So the first thing here, a guide to build a single, fi single feature app. Um, I don't know if anybody here knows about the lean startup method. It's this concept of picking a very small part of what you know, business you want to build and just implementing one thing at a time. So start small, test your market, then move on. And if, if it works, add new apps, uh, add new features. But if it doesn't work, build a different application. So that's what I kind of mean by this idea of a single feature app. The idea of a single feature app is just something small. So best example is, you know, we've got, what, 80 developers here? Hands up who's got a folder in their laptop that is projects that they've done, you know, weekend stuff and they've, you know, they wanted like one feature and they just did it for themselves. Now, keep your hands up if you've released any of those for the wider world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got a few in the back there and we've got one up the front, but there's this, there's this disconnect between us writing projects and things for ourselves that we get a little bit of value for, but we never, we never put in the investment to implement a login system because, you know, something that takes a day, maybe a few hours, you're not going to spend a week making sure that the email sign-up system's working, that, you know, uh, reset emails, charging for things, implementing Stripe, making sure their recurring payments is working, because it's not worth it, you know. It had value for you in that one day and when you wanted to use it, but it's not worth the investment of building the full login system. But, you know, we're not all special snowflakes. There are other people out there that if you can get your app up, they will be able to get a little bit of value for it, even if it's just like, you know, a pound, a euro's worth or a five euro's worth of value, you, you might want to do that, you know? Um, <clears throat> so that's one of the, the concepts here, this single feature app, something small, those weekend projects. Um, so the other part of this is the, uh, in three days, including deployment, I should probably have put a few asterisks here, and you probably saw this coming, but uh, <laughs> the, the asterisk on the first one in the three days is, it, it means if you do it my way, and this is again back to that idea of the React way of doing things, it's almost impossible for me to build a system that can get you up and running incredibly quickly if you don't have a few assumptions about how your application is actually built. So what I mean by my way at the moment is, Ember in the front end and Node in the back end. Now, as a businessman, you know, that's a really bad idea. That reduces the pool of people who can actually use this. Very, very small. But there are reasons for this decision. And it's only temporary. You know, if this takes off and if we're, I'm able to build it as a company, then we're going to be able to expand and implement a quick, happy path for all of the other good front end and back end systems. So let's... Uh, jump in a little bit and see, see what that actually looks like. So as I said, I am absolutely in love with Ember. And um, we're all, how, how many people have actually used Ember here? So we've got a f quite a few people. So how, how many people have actually built apps like for their work or actually released some apps? OK, Intercom people, of course. <laughs> um, if, you're, if you're not familiar with Ember, you, you might have heard about this idea of the Ember CLI. So what you saw there, if, it was, if you were quick enough, you'd see you running Ember New and then naming your app, and it would build an app for you. So it, it's one of these kind of scaffolding ideas. You can get up and running really quickly. And then you do an NPM start once you're in your new app. And after, you know, I skipped over the whole NPM install because that takes ages. Um, after you actually run it, you get a, uh, oh, I skipped a slide. Oh, well you get a nice Ember app that has a welcome to Ember uh, and gives you a bit of information about what you, what you do next. So in my case, what I do most of the time next is I install a thing called Ember Paper, which if you've not heard about it before, Ember Paper is a material design, so Google's material design implementation for Ember. Very much like 
Angular material. In fact, they use a lot of the same assets and CSS and things like that. So I do that because I'm not a designer, and I use modules to build essentially simple CRUD apps. So this is an example of what I built for the AuthMaker dashboard to manage your instances. And the way that this works is you build an instance and it has a bit of details, normal kind of CRUD stuff. But as you can see, you can get up and running quite quickly, and I did this in about two hours just because of, you know, I'm, I'm used to Ember and I've done that sort of stuff. Um, actually, probably about three hours because I added a bit of uh, uh, bells and whistles on the edit side of things just to make sure you don't destroy your login system. Um, but yeah, it's a simple kind of CRUD system where you can edit things and you can change details. And this is the kind of quintessential CRUD uh, creation system in Ember. You just make forms. It has this whole idea of an Ember data so that it kind of helps you through the process. Um, the next thing that you do at this stage, if you've built yourself a little one single feature app, is you probably install a thing called Ember Simple Auth. And as you can probably get uh, the impression here, a lot of the stuff in Ember is a community solution to how you actually solve your common problems. Ember Simple Auth is like a community solution to how do you log into your app. It supports a lot of different backends, so you can use Facebook login and just kind of only log into your app using Facebook, which is kind of cool, it's kind of awesome. Um, but what I ended up doing is I built myself an AuthMaker Ember simple auth. So you, all you really need to do is Ember install Ember uh, simple auth, the, the, the kind of base library, then you Ember install AuthMaker symbol auth, and you see there at the bottom where you put in a little bit of details of your AuthMaker configuration. That is all that you need to be able to have a login system that looks a little bit like this. So this is one of our clients. You click the sign in button up the top, it brings you to an AuthMaker login. Colors are a bit funny here because the, the colors that they use are just off what, what GIFs are able to uh, record and then you come into your app. So it's, it's really kind of a 20 minute, 30 minute thing of just configuring your Ember app to be able to log into it like this. So when, this, is, this is one of the reasons why I say doing this my way, as in using Ember, you're a, I'm able to give you most of the tools that you don't actually have to develop. I don't need to give you lots and lots of documentation on how to implement these different bits and pieces. I can just say, install this, put this information here, and then it'll just work. So that's most of the front end stuff. I'm happy to go into more detail in that. I could talk about this for hours, but let's uh, go into the next fun thing. So the back end side of things. As we saw with the security thing, you shouldn't be doing any security style stuff on the front end only. You need to do it on the back end. Um, and one of the things that I did, you know, again, talking back to my early days in JavaScript, I didn't really have a way to structure my Node apps. Um, <coughs> one of the good things about Node is that it, it subscribes to the Unix ethos of small modules. So you have lots of different bits and pieces that work really well at the one thing that they're supposed to do, but sometimes it's difficult to know how to tie them all together. And again, it's this idea that you need, to, you need to know what you're doing before you can get started. So one of the things that a lot of people do in the kind of introduction to Node uh, uh, tutorials is they say, use Express. And Express is amazing. A lot of people use Express. It's one of the most depended on uh, libraries in Node. Um, but one of the things that we noticed was when you actually implemented Express, if, if you've, who, who's actually used Express in Node.js before? So, ah, almost everybody, great. As you know, if, you're, if you have access to the app, you can do app.get anywhere in your application, and essentially you can have a handler for a request anywhere in the app. And it's sometimes hard to actually find that. So if you're onboarding new developers, you say, you'll always get those questions, oh, where is this function handled? Where is this thing handled? Where is this thing handled? And it, you lose track of where things are. Uh, uh, Express came up with the Express router, which made things an awful lot better. But uh, before that came out, we built a thing called uh, Express Auto Route. 
Express auto root is this really kind of a simple syntax where you um, see at the top there you've got a an object and you've got get requests and then you've got post requests and delete requests. So you're able to look at this and say, oh, this uh, file deals with the get test, get test with ID, post, so creation and deletion, and you get that at the top of the file. So you're able to look and find this stuff really easily. And one of the, the best things about this is that it actually allows you to have a folder structure under roots and the actual names of the folders as you're getting deeper and deeper get added to the, the uh, routing URLs. So in this case, if you wanted to hit the unsubscribe route, you'd have to go to your app URL, forward slash v1, forward slash email, forward slash unsubscribe, which is a very good way for you to be able to explain to new developers and to structure your app how, how to find the piece of code that actually does things. But this isn't, this isn't actually helping you get up and running with an MVC really quickly. So one of the things that we found out is even if you're doing this, you still have to build the CRUD. You still have to access the database. You still need to create things and put all your business logic in. So again, what we did is we built something to help you. We built this thing, Express Autoroot JSON. So this is an example of what Express Autoroot JSON does. And what this does is it builds an Autoroot get, put, post, delete uh, object for you that in this case deals with a, an instance model. Now, this may look like a, like a skeleton, you know, this won't work, you need to add lots of code into it. This works. You point somebody at your app forward slash instances and that will get you find all instances. It, it works, there's no extra code necessary for you to be able to find, create, update or delete instances using this. Uh, and it talks JSON API, which means that it's an Ember uh, compatible technology. So that's now talking to the front end, all the bits that we've already given you in the front end. So again, I'm kind of digressing away from the idea of AuthMaker, so this login, so this idea of authentication, authorization. So let's get back into that. How do you add authentication to this? Well, with an authentication line, obviously. Um, and then you have this module, again, something that we built for you so that you don't have to do it, that verifies the access token as it comes in and checks to see if you have the permission to do instance management. And if you do, then all of these uh, functions are available to you. And this is all stuff that you pull in. And again, there's no magic here. That works. You don't need to do anything else. You do need to configure, again, like I said, where the AuthMaker instance is, how to get to your database that actually deals with the tokens and things like that. But that works out of the box. So that's the authentication side. How do you do authorization? Um, well, with an authorization hook. Um, this is an idea that every single one of the find, create, and update, sorry, the find, update, and delete hooks will um, add this to the query before it hits the database. So you have this idea that all of the instance objects need to have a user ID on them. And there's no way for you to get past this to request somebody else, else's instance uh, object. Um, this also kind of implies that you need to create an object with an, a user ID. So you, we have an extra little kind of an helper here so that during create, you can configure bits and pieces like the pre-middleware. and as the uh, body is coming in, you add the current logged in user, which is provided by the AuthMaker Verify Express, you add that user's ID to the thing that's just about to be created. And again, so this is the sort of stuff that you would have, if you have like four or five models in your single feature application, you would have four or five files, if it's basic, that look exactly like that. And that's it, that's all you need. So like I said, Part of this is it's difficult to actually know how to structure all of this. So we built a Yeoman generator where you can just uh, create all of this structure using all of the things. And all you need to do is change the actual settings to be able for it to start working. So this is uh, typing very slowly in my little GIF. Um, 
uh, nice little comedy, so that, you know, developing's hard. Um, and it creates a folder structure for you with models, this idea, in this case it creates a, uh, an example model with an example root. Um, and you get a nice folder structure that you can start developing with afterwards. So if you, if you kind of follow my train of thinking here, once we create this AuthMaker instance that's actually doing the login for you, and you've created your Ember app, and that Ember app is using Ember data, which uses our AuthMaker Ember simple auth to authenticate with the back end, and then talks to one of these, that means that if you generate each part of that, you now only have to add the bits and pieces that are your own personal business logic to this app before you actually go and release it. And part of this whole problem is dealt with on the AuthMaker side of things because all of the payment and all that sort of stuff is done for you in AuthMaker. So you don't ever have to create that Stripe account. We use a Stripe Connect system to create that Stripe account for you. So it's, it's something that you don't have to deal with because we're able to deal with it for you. Um, and that is a little bit of a whirlwind in, uh, explanation of what exactly AuthMaker is. Um, like I said, I can talk about this for weeks. I wanted to try and give you guys a overall uh, perspective of what it is. And I'd probably need a little bit of feedback to say that, oh, I didn't quite get this part. So just tweet at me, come get me after this. I want to hear as much feedback as you can. Um, I'm, I'm open for questions as well. But one of the things that I'm doing at the moment is that I am starting this AuthMaker Pioneers program. So I'm trying to find 10 people who have these sort of uh, apps that they've got on their laptops that they might want to release to the world. Uh, it's beneficial if it's Ember and uh, Node, Ember in the front end, Node in the back end, because then I can just plug in AuthMaker for you and there's no rewrite necessary. But even if somebody has an idea for an app that they want to do and they want to get out there quickly, come find me. I'm trying to, like I said, get 10 people implementing this. Um, I have two uh, pioneers at the moment that I just wanted to mention just to kind of give you an idea of who I'm trying to target here. Um, one of the guys was a developer, uh, sorry, a designer that I was working with in my first startup. And he was a HTML and CSS guy and only a tiny little bit of JavaScript. He came to me when we were working in the startup and said, I want to le learn more JavaScript. And I told him, you're going to regret that. Um, <laughs> So as it turns out, he was, he was quite good and he was eager to learn, so now he's an Ember expert. So we've got this designer who has all of the tools necessary to build an entire Ember app, including all the models and all the actions and all the everything, but just doesn't have that last piece for the server side. He knows little, little bits and pieces of JavaScript, but just not enough, just enough to be dangerous, again. Um, so he's, he started trying to use something like Firebase, but it was like even with his simple use case, it was just outside what Firebase was able to give him. So he's going to be re-implementing his backend in AuthMaker and Autoroot JSON. So that's, that's quite an exciting one. Um, the second pioneer that I just wanted to kind of point out is this, which released last week. Uh, it's a thing called Mentoring Mate. I think it's mentoringmate.com, um, or maybe it's .io. I'll tweet the link after this. But this is way bigger than just a single feature app. Um, this is uh, Timmy O'Matney, one of the guys I went to college with. He is a really good uh, developer. And it's a, it's a little bit frightening to have the best auth maker application built by somebody else outside of the team. Uh, and it's a, really, it's a really fully featured app. And I sat down with him directly and kind of worked through all of the, the issues. And he said that overall, the application took about three weeks to build, his, the, like including the AuthMaker implementation. And the AuthMaker install, the bit just integrating AuthMaker, was about two days out of those three weeks. Now, that's not the three days that I'm trying to aim for. My goal is to make it so you start from nothing and get to a fully featured deployed app in three days. But this is why I need pioneers. I need people who are going to try it and work out the bugs with me, and we can bring that time down. But even at that, a full app like this that he's now selling to mentoring organizations 
two days to install all of the authentication, all of it, including the payment, is way more, way shorter than if we had to build something from scratch. And that is it. Do we have any questions? Can you, Mike? Thanks. Are you doing hosting as well? As so the way that this works at the moment is that I'm hosting the AuthMaker instance. Um, it is going to be open source. Uh, I'm going to go through a process with these uh, pioneers and uh, make sure that uh, any of the issues are ironed out. Um, I'm, I'm bootstrapping it, so I'm a little bit cash strapped at the moment. So I'm also going to be trying to pay for uh, security uh, audits on it. And when I, once I do that, I'm going to uh, release it open source. But even at that, um, if you took the code and try to run it, it's quite difficult getting up and running. And that already beats the, the idea of getting your app and the AuthMaker install running in three days. So the idea is that you come to AuthMaker.com, you say, I want a new AuthMaker instance, please. It gives you all the details that you need for the Ember Simple Auth side of things and for the uh, AuthMaker Verify Express thing in Node. And you give AuthMaker details to connect to your Mongo database. So um, we're recommending that people use something like MLab so that you don't have to host a Mongo instance. You can get a free uh, sandbox to start off with for these kind of um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> MVPs. And then if it starts generating revenue for you, then you can start investing in a better hosting environment. And I know uh, MongoDB have got an Atlas install now where they do the managing, but you have, I, I think it's like a database as a service kind of thing. I'm not sure if you have access to the, the instances with Atlas, but the idea is that we're not hosting your data. We're not going for any vendor lock-in at all, ever. But, but is Mongo a, a required dependency? So you don't have to build your app in Mongo. The authentication stuff does go into Mongo. Um, for the auth to root, uh, sorry, for the express auto root JSON, for that really nice, uh, structure, you do need to have Mongo, where you can just kind of get away with this, put in a mongoose object that describes your, uh, your uh, schema, and then we can build everything from that. Um, we have looked at expanding that, but essentially, like I said before, we're not trying to go for solve everything all at once. We're trying to get a happy path that works for people and getting people up and running as quickly as possible. And then once we've got that, and once we're able to open it up further, we will. But we're not going to do that unless we get happy paths for people. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Thank you. First of all, fair play, and thanks for the talk. Um, I um, have, over the last six months, been on and off writing an authentication framework between Angular 2 and Play at the back end using Deadbolt and other technologies. And it's no joke. It's it can be a hard thing to do and a hard thing to get right. Um, so I wanted to say fair play, number one. And number two, it's a great idea as well. I think it's a fabulous idea because I was relating a lot to what you were saying. But um, can you talk a little bit more deeply, just a little bit more about what you mean by auth? Like, are we talking about role-based authentication? Are we talking about a single sign-on? Or what, what do you mean when you talk about auth? Because I didn't really get that too clearly from your talk. Yeah, so the, I, again, like I kind of mentioned, there's lots of pieces of this talk that can be talks in their own right. So going into the details of actually how the auth is structured is something that you know, I want to do with the pioneers, with people who are interested in actually implementing this stuff. Um, and then you know, one of the things that I didn't actually mention in the talk, but I had double underlined, is that <laughs> the first thing that I noticed out of this pioneer program is that I can't just be a product company. I need to be an education company. Because it's not just about this product that I'm trying to build, it's about teaching people how to use it in a particular way. Now, on that point, um, those sort of role-based authentication systems can be quite complicated for a lot of people, especially if you're trying, again, bringing back to this idea of getting a MVP up and running as quickly as possible. Um, currently, there is no role-based uh, authentication but there is, we've, we've implemented this four times for clients 
in their full application and we've never had to use full role-based uh, um, authentication for this at all. It has groups, so like um, essentially teams, uh, companies or whatever the, the idea is. So you, can, you have this kind of group-based, a single group for a particular uh, client and it has it supports things like uh, out of the box with the author uh, the express uh, no which which one's which one's this one called let me just go back because they're all auth maker something so auth maker verify express um supports uh rate limiting and just kind of feature based uh authentication so kind of what scopes are for OAuth 2. So if you can describe something as a scope in a particular plan and then assign people to that plan, then this will work for you. And a lot of the times we find that that's more than enough for a lot of the, like the majority of applications. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what kind of uh, authorization, uh, authentication, sorry, provider do you support? I mean, Facebook, Google? Uh, Google. Currently, we have Facebook, Google, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, essentially, they are, I'm, I'm working on how this actually works for you as a, as a client coming to Offmaker at the moment. The idea is that you give us your, um, your credentials for various uh, third party uh, authenticators and then when you do that login, I think I can go back to it. Uh, do, 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 this one here. Once you click the sign in, and then you get to this page, there, the ones that you've enabled are all down the bottom. So it's like sign in or sign in with blah 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 blah. blah. So currently, it's uh, Facebook, Google, Twitter, LinkedIn, Trello. That's a bit of a weird one, but it's you know it's 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 Node. It's using. It's implemented, not to get into the kind of uh, grass here, but it's implemented in uh, Passport. So for me to implement a, another one is almost trivial. Not quite trivial, but almost trivial, because I need to translate what Passport gives you into what I'm doing internally with uh, Authmaker. Um, and you said it incorpor incorporates payments and pricing and stuff? Or? Yeah. So. Um, can probably give a demo. Do I have something? I'll give a private demo if somebody wants it. I can log into a client's uh, instance and show it. So I'm not going to do that on the. Uh, so it, it incorporates this idea that. Um, so so you as a as a customer, you'll be able to go to your Authmaker instance and go to admin forward slash admin, and then because you're the owner of that instance, you can you know point and click admin panel, create plans, assign permissions to them. Uh, yeah, so it's, I, <laughs> I always forget how this is structured, but like I said, it's this plan-based idea. So you have permissions, you then assign those permissions, and then you have a customer, quote unquote, that has users assigned to that customer, and then that customer would have plans. So it, it, again, this is the whole education piece but uh, you're able to set up that whole stuff without having to get into any code. You can just point and click, boom, 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 and set it up. Um, oh, got yeah, one more. Just one more question. <coughs> what do you plan to charge for this? So the, the plan at the moment is that I'm not going to charge anything because I'm not going to charge anything up front. I'm trying to build a platform here and in, on that vein, I want to do it as a revenue share. Um, part of the Pioneer process is that the, the amount of revenue share and uh, what it would cost monthly if you wanted to go into like a, a pro level is going to be the 10 people who actually come onto the Pioneer program will be able to influence that going forward. But the idea is that um, I'm not sure if this is going to be an automated thing or if it's just going to be harassing people on the phone, but as soon as your uh, revenue share revenue crosses a particular threshold, so say that the minimum like infinite plan that costs X a month, 
once you cross that, there's no point in you being on the revenue share model anymore. You can just swap to kind of essentially a maximum payment to use the entire system. Um, and I never want to be in a case where I want to restrict people using this um, if they can't pay for it up front. I want them to rev share. But on that vein as well, I don't think initially, again, just because this is a bootstrap business, I don't think initially I'm going to provide a fully free uh, system for people. You have to charge something for users to use your app. Like, the whole point of this is that you can charge your users uh, a euro a month. And that's okay. I don't care how small it is. But it's, it's not designed for people creating free apps that have hundreds of thousands of users. Because Stormpath and all those uh, other ones, Auth0, they do uh, their cost based on number of requests to the system. And I think that's like that can destroy an application. You know, if you've, if you've, got, if you've got a lot of um, uh, popularity, if you get like a, a big blog post that goes viral, you shouldn't have to have this giant bill at the end of the month. You should be able to take a lot of that money in. And if we do it as a rev share, then we both benefit, essentially. Hope that answers your question. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Awesome.